Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome to a new video. I'm joined with Sajid and we have a lot to say today. Am I doing the intro or are you doing the intro? I, I thought never, I was I doing never, it. I was. I, I never know of these things. You beat me to it. Yeah, Allah, alhamdulillah. There, there's so many thoughts uh, about this before even getting into it. But the first thing I just want to get across to the audience is the reason behind doing these videos. Because now we're, I think people are starting to get this perception that we're the guys that go after the mashayikh. We're the guys that go after and, and criticize the ulama and condemn the ulama. And yeah, you know, that's, that's a perception that's slowly starting to build. Um, do you have any thoughts that you'd like to share on that perception? I mean, just the perception of who are from the ulama right off top. I mean, we're going after scholars, we're going after ulama. That's... Uh... It's an interesting allegation, especially considering who we're talking about today. Did you do some research regarding his credentials? Um, to be honest, I didn't. I didn't. Um, he's someone who's been on the scene, on the Dawah scene for a while. Um, so that's where I know him from. Um, and I've been receiving messages and comments for, I don't know, maybe like two years. People saying, oh, Farid, when are you going to respond to Shabir Ali? And I was like, what's wrong with Shabir Ali? Um, I had no idea. But have, have you looked into his credentials? Have you looked into um, his background? Well, yeah, I mean, I don't, I didn't memorize them, but not too long ago, I checked them out and he just, you know, he's Western educated. So from the looks of it, what he has learned regarding Islam is going to be from the West. It's going to have that Oriental perspective, which is essentially poison. <laughs> so, I mean, that, I, I don't think I can, strongly emphasize enough how important it is for people to understand what orientalism is and the importance of learning your religion from the right people from not only believers but educated believers with a proper understanding of the deen you know people have to understand just like if you were to go somewhere every day and they were going to abuse you they were going to beat you with sticks and hit you it's going to take a toll on your body you're going to break your bones you're going to suffer as a result by the end you're not going to be able to walk properly or sit properly without pain you're, you're putting your iman in a position by sitting with these people to have your iman beat and hit and to fill yourself with doubts. So we have to not only be aware of our, our physical reality and the way that our environment affects us, but also the unseen world, our spiritual reality, our iman, and how our environment also affects that. You're going to mention something about al-aql um, uh, wal-naql, I recall, before we started this thing, if you want to... Yes. Yeah. I wanted to share a benefit that we can all come come away with and remember. Um, there is this authentic quote of Ali, the great companion. May Allah be pleased with him. If this religion were based on opinion, then the bottom of the leather socks would be wiped instead of the top. But rather, I saw the messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, wipe over the top of his leather socks. So there's two main points I just want us all to derive from this and to remember, um, especially as we react to this upcoming video. And number one, Islam is about following revelation. Islam is about submitting to Allah. Allah knows everything. He sent the Prophet ﷺ with guidance. So we, we submit to that, we follow that. If our intellect, our conjecture, our perspective conflicts with that, we know the deficiency is with our own perspective, our own conjecture. So that's a very simple, but it's a foundational concept of what Islam actually is. So, that's number one. And then number two, the importance of following the understanding of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. This was the best generation. They were taught by the Prophet ﷺ himself. And we need to understand the religion according to how they understood it. So that, that inshallah, is the theme for this video. So everyone can benefit in that regard. And unless there's anything else you want to say, we can get to this video sure. that... You chose. Actually, so, so it was this this video that we're about to see is made by Brother One Dawa, and um, he's been gathering some uh, Shabir Ali's clips. And what he did was he sent me a, a short version, um, and uh, yeah, let's let's check it out together, and then let's share our thoughts on um, what we're about to see. And for the full video, um, be sure to check out his channel. Um, he, uh, he, he shared some of the juicy stuff, but not all the juicy stuff. Some of the, I, I, I don't even know if the word juicy is the right word to use, but some of the um, crazier, the, the most heretical stuff, uh, he didn't even share with us. I think, I think he's trying to 
يعني, uh, he doesn't want your blood pressure to go through the roof. So يعني, some, some rahma there from him. I'm glad we had somewhat of a lighthearted intro because things are about to go downhill very fast, subhanAllah. Um, let's just get right into it. Okay, all right. Okay, bismillah. Do you believe that stoning is stoning, sorry, is part of the Islamic Sharia? No, no. Are Hajj punishments like cutting the hands of thieves still applicable today? My answer will be controversial because many people would think automatically, yeah, that's the law of God written in the Quran, it must apply for all time. But it's not so simple. And it would seem that in modern times when there is so much concern with preserving the human body, even replacing a hand uh, and, and even doing uh, tra uh, transplants of the human hand now, uh, that uh, it would be out of place to apply such a ruling. Naturally, we need deterrence and we need to call people to what is good, but there are other ways of doing that. Okay, so um, yeah, any, uh, off, off, off the top of my head, um, without even quoting evidence for this, um, but we do know it's in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim hadith about stoning um, from the narrations of Umar ibn Khattab. I believe we even have a report of Ali uh, stoning someone and Rasulullah stoning someone as well. Um, if I'm not mistaken, through the hadith of uh, Jabir, Wallahu alam. But yeah, it's something that's established, it's something in the Sahihain. But what I find really, really interesting is he'll shrug it off as a no, no, you know, and it's, it's, it's just nowhere there as if. Uh, but what's frustrating is um, when it's clear cut in the Quran, he still shrugs it off. And he still is like, yeah, but, you know, uh, we need to do things differently now. He, instead of submitting, okay, this is what the Quran says, this is what the authentic Sunnah says, this is what the companions of the Prophet ﷺ understood. What does he say? He says, oh, well, there's, you know, nowadays there's so much energy put in preservation of like, you know, people's, what, fixing their hands, he said? <laughs> I mean, um, what, what kind of uh, evidence is that in terms of taking something clearly from the Quran and Sunnah saying, no, we're not going to follow that. Nowadays, you know, we don't want to, cut off anyone's hand because there's uh, so much you know effort put into somebody who who you know lost their hand you know coming up with robotic technology to to fix their hand so therefore you know we need deterrence but uh we, we this isn't applicable today i mean what this is clearly somebody don't be fooled by the beard and by the kufi so so it's really interesting that he looks like this and it's really interesting that you pointed out that he looks like this he looks like a traditional muslim um and you know, that is strange, isn't it? It is strange for him to look like a traditional Muslim while having these views. Usually, um, I mean, I mean, he looks a lot more traditional than I do, right? But he, he's, he's clearly not a conservative Muslim. We use the Quran and Sunnah to derive what is true and what is not. So if somebody isn't using that, it, it doesn't matter who you are, what you look like, what your prof profession is. Um, and, and that's why attaching yourself to personalities is something we all need to, to struggle against because so many people just attach themselves to personalities rather than attaching themselves to the Quran and Sunnah. And this is how they end up being fooled and being led astray by people. And, and there's a hadith from the Prophet والسلام, about this exact thing, about the scholars dying, which it seems like every day you're, you're hearing news of, new, of more and more scholars dying, passing away. And then you're seeing more and more evidence of widespread people who are ignorant, who are speaking about things that they shouldn't be speaking about, passing fatwas without knowledge and leading people astray because people are following them. It's like this has been foretold. Um, I've actually come across someone who, um, I think it was a Malki Sheikh, who um, argued for this uh, about, I don't know, a few hundred years ago, um, 400 years ago, 500 years ago. He was deemed a heretic. You know, they, they, they uh -huh. you had takfir, you had, um, like being made uh, against him because of saying saying the same thing, saying that uh, we, we shouldn't cut hands off anymore. Uh, SubhanAllah, one thing I'd, I'd also like to mention about the importance of uh, these hudud, um, especially cutting off the hands, um, theft is almost non-existent here in, in this part of the world. Um, I, I was. I, I remember. I used to lock my car. Uh, not too. Yeah, yeah. I, I still lock my car all the time. Um, and a, a brother who who's from Philly, he said to me, "Why are you locking your car?" And I was like, "Yeah, it's just a habit." And he says, 
you don't need to lock your car. People don't steal cars over here. Uh, and and like uh, yeah, any any Grand Theft Auto is a big thing in the states, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, look, he said we need deterrence, but yeah. he's trying to say not to you. Okay, where are you going to derive the deterrence from? Do you know better than Allah and his messenger? No, you don't. Where are you going to derive these deterrents from? Yeah, the d deterrent might seem, you know, harsh by certain standards, but okay, don't do it. And then the whole of the society flourishes. The same with drugs. The same with drugs. When, we, when I was in Medina, I actually saw an execution. So somebody had smuggled in uh, a bunch of heroin and they got caught. So they were executed. So, you know, a bunch of us students, we went and we witnessed the execution and it was like, it was such a such a deterrent, obviously. But the thing is, is, if you compare that to any inner city in America, Achi, they have been completely destroyed due to drugs. Particularly, I grew up outside of Baltimore in Maryland, and we would go to Baltimore. And I've, I've interviewed a, a brother from Baltimore on my channel, Abdul Rafi. He was also graduated from Medina. But it, it's so horrible and horrific what happened to these communities just because of crack cocaine, just because of heroin. I mean, you're talking about broken families. You're talking about the murder rate. You're talking about crime. There's such wisdom in the Sharia because, okay, yes, this deterrent is very harsh, but it's much worse for you to allow this to proliferate in your society. And I mean, this is well known in America, Akhi, like, like the crack epidemic, heroin, drugs. I mean, the, it, how it has completely destroyed generations and cities and towns. Um, so there, there's so for somebody to then come and, and act like they know better than Allah. This is why you just submit to the Sharia because Allah already knows. Allah created all of this. If He says this is this is the proper deterrent, then that's what it is. You know. So it's like if you're left to your own conjecture, you're not going to fix it if it if it doesn't coincide with the divine revelation because Allah knows. God. The viewer is asking, do you want secularism in a Muslim country where it's law-based is on human reasoning? Uh, meaning that secularism obviously will have a human-based uh, yeah. uh, reasoning be, uh, as the basis of its law. Um, so what I want to, more generally, more generally, uh, I feel that it's, it's best that uh, the, the rule is governed according to uh, the majority um, the, the decision within uh, within a particular state, so that uh, you know th there is a gradual process, and things changed based on majority votes to uh, you know there's a new proposal, and then um, there's so a, a democratic referendum, society. The, the de democratic sort of system. Uh, this this seems to work best in our modern times. A democratic system works well. Um, uh, so let's say we have a, a purely Islamic theocracy, mm -hmm. and uh, now uh, eventually you have non-Muslims uh, entering that society, living there, and uh, they grow in numbers. Now, naturally, the question of minority rights uh, come up, and this is where uh, Islamic societies need need to change in that they have to recognize the rights of minorities, they have to recognize the rights of women, uh, of uh, people more more generally, the rights of elderly, uh, and and this is where they're failing. It's not that they're not democratic. It's just that uh, they are not looking at uh, the, the rights of, of, of various um, entities. And uh, if, of course, uh, a society so changes that the majority becomes non-Muslim, then there will be no sense of imposing an Islamic law on them, and the law will naturally evolve to be a, a, a secular type of law. Uh, I think I was, I was uh, really amazed by his last point about um, if... if uh, if the if the country is no longer um, I uh, I mean if, if it's no longer a minority non-Muslim community and it's a majority non-Muslim community, um, Sharia shouldn't apply. I, I thought that was really interesting. What are your thoughts on that? Okay, my thoughts are I don't care what anyone thinks. I just care what the divine revelation teaches. Okay, if you have a certain understanding a certain proper authentic connection to the Quran and Sunnah, then I would love to hear you relay that information. I don't want to hear your own opinion and conjecture that isn't based on that. I don't care. Like what makes you special in that regard? I mean, we have the Quran and Sunnah, we have divine revelation, and then we have the opinions of, of random people. I, I don't care. And that, that that's why it's so important sometimes to be harsh with these people and to call them out publicly because they present themselves as people who are connecting the community to the Quran and Sunnah when they're not. They're doing the opposite. They are changing the Quran and Sunnah. They are leading people astray. And it's like, 
subhanAllah, the, the way that people, you know, then give us a hard time about it, Akhi. I saw the tweet that you had just posted where Sheikh um, Kareem Abu Zaid, you know, he's refuting Yasser Qadi, and still some people in these comments are like, you know, giving you a hard time about it. It's like, don't, like, I don't get it, Akhi. It drives me crazy. I mean, subhanAllah, I guess I just have to sort of try to ignore that, but uh, I, I, I just does not make any sense, man. Eh, subhanAllah, Akhi. Subhanallah. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's a really interesting moment. Come on, man, you got to meet my same energy, Akhi. You need to throw something across the room and start screaming. I, I, I don't have too many thoughts on this one. Inshallah, inshallah I might have yeah. the next one. This is a, a, an interesting question. It's about the power of black magic, and this person is saying, um, "How do you protect yourself against black magic, and is it able to cause death?" that magic has been taught by two angels and then the devils then continue to to uh, instigate people to use that knowledge so the knowledge from the angels was good knowledge and then the angel is the devil is now causing people to use that for evil purposes so it's the use of this for evil purposes that uh, is thought to be prohibited in the islamic faith hmm. can uh, people be effective in using such magic today i i i I haven't seen any real case of this happening, uh, and uh, it seems uh, rather unlikely. It seems that if people had this power, they would be doing things that uh, are uh, much, much greater than, than some, some of the individual stories we hear. Like mm. individual stories, somebody says, you know, that somebody looked at me the wrong way, and that caused my marriage to fail, or mm. I start to lose my jobs, or I, you know, nothing in life is successful for me. Mm. So it seems to me that if people really had this kind of power, Power, they'll be using it to change governments, to you know, to to enact real uh, changes in the world rather than hurt uh, simple okay. ordinary. Um, the first thing it seems like he's conflating between hasid and black magic. These are two completely different things. Um, I don't know if he's, you know, that, that was like quite clear. Um, and uh, he's basing his re his rejection of the existence of black magic and in. in uh, our times um, due to his lack of uh, experience with it or he's never come across it. And yeah, this is not a reason to reject the existence of black magic. I mean, I've never seen anything myself. I've seen some really funky things um, that, I, that I can't explain, but, but um, I wouldn't necessarily call it uh, magic. Um, but yeah, yeah he, I have no issues with believing um, in fact, I, I do have to believe in the existence of magic and the supernatural because it's in the Quran and the Sunnah. And it's quite worrying when someone's going to reject the existence of it today simply because they've never come across uh, anything of that nature. I know people that have come across that, and, and almost everyone knows someone that's come across that. Um, people who aren't even religious... I, I know people I have uh, religious family, uh, excuse me, um, non-religious family members who uh, share stories of uh, the supernatural. Um, so I have no reason to to reject that. Um, but SubhanAllah, man. SubhanAllah. <sighs> yeah, I mean, uh, I did an interview with John Fontaine where he was talking about his conversion story. And there are certain parts of the world where this is very prevalent. And he actually saw it with his own eyes. Um, black magic being put to use and this sort of um, played a role in him in his conversion you know because Islam spoke about these things and he knew and he knew it was true so like you said I mean it, it, just to to conflate Hasid and black magic and again he's he's just saying to me I think you know it's just his own feelings about things and he's obviously not even really knowledgeable about the topic um, and this is also something I think that happens is that like he had debates with Christians, right? That's that's how he reached let's, prominence, let's, correct? Let, let's move back to, to both of us on the screen. Too much too much Shabir for today, if okay. you don't mind. Oh, yeah, sure. yeah, it's it's over, time. right? Okay. Yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Guys, go check out the video, the full video in the description. Um one dawa. Big up one dawa. That's what <laughs> the folks in the UK like to say. Um fa yeah, please carry on with that point. That's a very important point that you're about to make. Yeah, oh, yeah. He, did, so he, he did rise to prominence through uh, debating. But right. that is so people have certain expertise, right? Yeah. And then 
and then they go beyond their expertise. They might be good in a certain field, like right. refuting Christianity. That does not mean you are an expert in fiqh or right. tafsir or hadith. But I feel like so many of us, we, if somebody has, they, they've shown that they're brilliant in one particular way, for example, then we just think that they're brilliant in, in everything. And, and we've recently seen this. I don't want to bring up any any names, but well, yeah. your, your whole thing with, with uh, Dr. Zakir Naik, you know, yeah, yeah. May Allah yeah. bless him and, and guide him to what's best. I mean, I mean, very similar case. He's done great work, but when people step out of their expertise, you're going to have people who just assume that they are just as much an expert in this field as they are in the other field that they rose to, to prominence through. And that's not always the case. And this is a, a clear example of that. I don't even think that Shabir is, um, from what I've heard, uh, I haven't seen too many of his debates, but yeah, yeah, I've, I've spoken to people who are um, also involved with that, um, Muslim Christian apologetics, and they say that Shabir isn't like, yeah, he isn't that high a level of, of he's not that high a level of. Uh, uh, yeah, of, I wouldn't even, yeah. I wouldn't know, but that is, I think, how he reached his. Yeah, yeah of course, definitely. Uh, uh, but, but you know, one becoming um, one uh, representing Islam in these debates doesn't mean that they're necessarily that good at it. Um, and an, an example of that is David Wood. David Wood has had tens of debates uh, against Muslims, um, and he's one of the he's one of the worst uh, debaters against Islam, Akhi, Subhanallah. Um, and you see him failing time after time. Um, and he keeps on representing Christianity. Uh, I don't know if, if they can't find anyone else mm. to do it, uh, but subhanAllah, um, he has a big channel, he has a big platform, and, and due to that, I'm guessing, uh, uh, he's being brought forward. Um, yeah. I did want to say before, I, I, forget, say before I forget, a lot of these issues, um, or these people, right, some might think it's just out the blue. We're jumping the gun. Oh, we saw this video. We watched it. Now we're making another video. The reality is many of us who are in the field of da'wah and students of knowledge and we're familiar with who's out there and what they're preaching, we've seen people go down a certain path for years. Okay, like Shabir Ali, for example. This is the first time we're saying anything publicly, but for years now, he's been saying many problematic things far beyond this little uh, compilation. That's only a few minutes um, in regards to, I think, particularly his understanding of Hadith and um, how he goes about deciding what he's going to accept and reject. But uh, the point is, is that, you know, this isn't just some, you know, random thing that happens. It's like, we, we see it going on. It, it goes on for a long time. It becomes, you know, you, you hope that people will rectify what they're doing, but they keep insisting and in getting worse and it becoming more well known and spreading uh, the deviations. And then, you know, eventually somebody has to say something. So um, I just wanted to, to clarify that. I mean, this is, this isn't even, I mean, this is what four minutes out of even, even the compilation itself, the full one is like 20 minutes. Right. And that's not even everything. So yeah, yeah, yeah of course, of course, of course. Um, I want I want to point out something very important about what you were mentioning earlier. Um, his main thing is polemics, and that is extremely important to keep in mind. Um, and I I would always recommend for for any seeker of knowledge, don't take your knowledge from someone who made a name from polemics, because people in polemics are just always not always, but yeah, I mean, most of the times they're always on the defensive. And them being on the defensive so much um, causes them to reinterpret the deen. Um, it's just, yeah, it's just a reality. It's just a reality. It, it's not uh, only any Muslim Christian uh, apologetics, but also even you know um, intersectarian debates um, has has exact same issue. You, you'll find a Sunni who will water things down in Sunnism. Um, because of how much he clashes with Shias. And the same thing with Shias. You, you will notice a Shi'i um, weakening hadith like, you know, it's, it's, like it's nobody's business. Um, however, if he was to apply those standards against his, his hadith in reality, he'd weaken everything. Um, and that's what Shabir has fallen into. 
uh, it started off, it seems like, wallahu alam, it started off with, oh, okay, um, this hadith is, is you know, th they're using this against Islam. Well, it, it must be a, an unreliable hadith. Instead of accepting it for what it is, instead of starting off with a background in ilm al-hadith and accepting these ahadith because they're actually authentic according to our standards, he's rejecting everything that they're, that anyone is using against us. And that's a huge danger. So I always recommend people to avoid um, taking uh, ilm from someone who's into apologetics. And that includes me, akhi. Don't take, don't take ilm from me. There's so many ulama out there. There's so many mashayikh out there. There's so many voices out there. And unfortunately, I've, I've been, this is, this is how I started off, you know, doing uh, refutations um, in Sunni Shi'i matters and whatnot. I'm sure that I've been in some way affected. I hope not. But, you know, it's, it's me uh, yani, trying to be consistent with the advice I'm giving. Yeah, it's tough because um, there is a need to respond to allegations and shubahat and things like that. But um, you don't want to overdo it and go to an extreme where that's all that you're ever doing. Um, you know, it is important to definitely address certain issues. But uh, at the same time, I mean, just get knowledge from the right people. There, there's so many resources. We have so many hundreds of years of scholarship that's so deep. Even like you were saying, if somebody comes across a hadith that they find to be problematic, we have scholars who have explained everything, okay? You, you might have this issue or you, you might perceive this thing and then they'll address it very clearly, you know? But it, it's, it's like, we don't need... And sometimes they don't. Sometimes they say, this is how it is. And it's your problem. If you don't like it, it's your problem. Khalas. <laughs> And, and when that happens, you have two choices. You either accept that it's your problem and you accept that your values are not divine and you accept that maybe you need to tweak some things within your head and you need to, you need to tweak your morals and values. Um, you know, or you have the, the other choice of rejecting uh, the, the words and sayings and orders of the Prophet wasallam because you thought you knew better, subhanAllah. Yeah, that, see, that's why the best thing to do is to just submit. <laughs> Allah knows everything. We don't know everything. Get knowledge from the right people. Don't expose yourself to all the shubahat and, and, and whatnot. And just have that strong, solid foundation. And inshallah, you'll be fine. You know, just try your best. I know we're living in times where it's easier said than done. But, um, I mean, the resources are out there. And a lot of us, we live in these countries where it might seem like it's it's so difficult, but it's not, I mean, a lot of it is just sort of having a little bit of courage, you know, just a, a little bit, uh, a little bit of uh, resistance to just going along with uh, with the crowd. You know, it's not always this, uh, th this huge deal that people make it out to be. A lot of us, we have the freedom to do it. It's just a matter of actually uh, taking advantage of that and also being proactive. I mean, if you're a Muslim, you have the truth with you. People who don't have that, they don't have the truth with them. So there should be a level of like being on the offense of trying to spread this, of trying to inform people because they don't know the truth. You have the truth. So instead of being on defense all the time and, and worried, it's like you have the truth with you. They don't, <laughs> you know, and maybe they're open to it. A lot of people are much more open to the truth of Islam than a lot of people would think based on what is being you know, considered politically correct out there. Um, yeah. You know, just because stuff is being pushed out in the media and whatnot, um, the reality is on the ground, individual to individual, people are much more open to a lot of these things than one might think. Um, so any last words for Reed? <laughs> I, th I think we owe Shabir a, a few last words before we're, we're done. So so the main, the main issues with Shabir, I just want to um, try to sum it up here. Um, the rejection of authentic narrations, um, and even when they're authentic, you see, I, I can understand when some people reject authentic narrations due to ignorance, um, but to reject them simply because they conflict with your values, that, that, that's a problem. If you have a valid reason, if you have a valid reason that's based on Ilm al-Hadith for you to reject some narrations, I understand that. But to reject things because it conflicts with your values, that's a huge problem. To and then uh, re reject something that you find in the Quran because it doesn't fit your values, again, that's a bigger problem. Um, I just want to point out, when you say your values, where are these values coming from, right? Yes. 
Where are they coming from? They're not coming from Islam. They're coming yeah. from growing up and being surrounded in non-Muslim countries and environments. Right. Right. They're very, very true. Very true. Um, so the reason we're doing this is we're, we're not here just to pick on Shebir. We're not, we're not here to pick on Shebir. We're here um, reacting to this because we want people to know um, that this person is not someone who is traditional in any way. He's one of the far one of the farthest people away from traditionalism, even though he looks the part. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. And and the yani, yani, uh, I don't know what to say, man. Allah I don't have hatred towards the guy. I'm disappointed in him. Um, I think he should just stick to to yani, what what he knows best. Maybe, maybe even um, brush up on that a bit more. Uh, get to. Um, Get better acquainted with with the latest material and and the polemics that he's interested in, and then get back to that instead of. Well, I, I, to be honest, maybe he shouldn't even be representing Muslims. To be honest, yeah, maybe he shouldn't that, even yeah, be doing that. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. when you reach this point, I mean, what? Yeah. Just, See, just these are major issues. Yeah. Just stay at home, yeah. Stay at home. May Allah guide him. May Allah guide all of us. You know, may Allah make us die upon the truth. I mean. Barakallah bro. Thanks, thanks for I'm exhausted, uh, man. You ruined my day yeah. once again for me. Uh, yeah, I'm yeah, just I'm just It does really yeah, upset me though. I, I take oh, okay. I, really, I, it really it really gets to me, man, when I see people. Shuf Habibi, Anna, I, I I appreciate you being upset about it. Um and I'd appreciate it much more than if you weren't. Uh, yeah, Alhamdulillah. I guess it is a good thing, inshallah. All right, okay. Look, Until looking next forward, time. Looking forward to, to many more uh, ups, upsetting uh, reactions from you, inshallah. Uh, okay, you owe me like a duck video or something, a duckling. All right. <laughs> 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 all right, everyone. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.